your jobs, your studies so seriously? <laughs> what is dearer to you than all that? What is dearer to you than all those uh, external material activities? What is dearer to you than your own body and mind? What is dearer to you than the body and mind of your beloveds? In fact, knowledge of Krishna will teach you that Krishna is more dear to you than your own self. Because Krishna is the self of yourself. What do we mean by Krishna? Who knows the literal translation of Krishna? The word. Why is Krishna all attractive? Because he is unlimitedly happy. <laughs> Indeed, he is the reservoir of all pleasure. Someone who is unlimitedly happy and has unlimited pleasure. That is all attractive. Now, what about you? How much pleasure can you say to have? How much happiness? Such a tiny bit. And for that tiny bit of momentary happiness and pleasure, you have to work and struggle so hard. How many of you go to work because you love to go to work, whether they pay you or not? Raise your hand. <laughs> you wake up in the morning and work. Oh, another day of work. <laughs> if you're married, you tell your family, I'm sorry, but I have to go to my real love now. Work is my everything. <laughs> no. You work in order to get something. You hope that by working, not only will you get the means to survive, but you'll also have the means to get pleasure. But you see, Krishna never works for his pleasure. That's why you always see Krishna carrying a flute. That he carries a flute is letting you know he's all play and no work. <laughs> this is what it means to be all attractive the all attractive reservoir of pleasure now shouldn't Krishna be able as a supreme expert in pleasure to give us knowledge of pleasure or are we so great that we don't need that information what do you think we know what we're doing we're experts. Look at our life, you can tell. <laughs> Do we really see that human beings are so expert in getting happiness? No, we see that they struggle. They go through such anxiety. They go through great length, such great endeavors to try and be happy. They travel to other parts of the world seeking their fortune. Just like so many of you have come to the lucky country <laughs> to seek your fortune. <laughs> yes, as you know, Australia is known as the lucky country. India is known as the land of Dharma. <laughs> Is there any real luck without dharma? But if the land of dharma forgets about what is dharma, what is Krishna, then how can there be any good fortune? We want more than luck in life. 
We want something substantial. Okay, let's talk about happiness. <clears throat> Material experts say that happiness is a process. It's not a goal. In other words, first you have to be happy and then you get success. Not that success brings happiness. There's some truth to that. If you don't know how to be happy within yourself, no matter what you do, it's going to be a problem. But so many people do think that first you get success and then you'll be happy. You might see that in yourself, yes? I need this, I need that. This title, that position, this education, this house, this car, and then I'll be successful, and that means happiness. So the mundane experts, the material experts, have a point that actually happiness is about an attitude that you already have before you set out to get something. And if you have that genuinely happy attitude, that will bring you success. It's not that success brings you happiness. There's a truth to this. Of course, these mundane experts don't really know what happiness is. They measure it according to ordinary social characteristics. But you want something deeper than that. The great wealth we spoke of this morning that India's wisdom has to offer to the world is knowledge of happiness that goes far deeper than superficial, surface, social versions of happiness. You know what social versions of happiness are. Like when you go to some social gathering and everyone's bubbling and speaking social words. <laughs> That's social happiness. You want to go deeper than that. What's a good, it's like when you go to a wedding, you know? <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> You're expected to go and everyone gets dressed up and of course a main question is how good will the food be, right? <laughs> and then everyone wants to see, if it's an interesting couple, they want to see, you know, who is the bride, you know, <laughs> like that. <laughs> I know because sometimes some of our practitioners, our devotees from India, they marry ladies from other countries. And so when there's a reception in India, thousands of people turn out <laughs> to see the French bride or the Korean bride. <laughs> it's exotic, so they want to see. Oh. <laughs> the news spreads. This is not an ordinary marriage reception. <laughs> so you know about those social events. Do you really consider that deep happiness when you go to those events? <laughs> In fact, I know quite a few uh, have told me that one reason they want to stay in India, excuse me, stay in Australia and not go back to India is because that way they don't have to attend the wedding every two weekends. <laughs> <laughs> Consider this point, but we're going to go deeper. That happiness brings success. It's not that success brings happiness. Once we understand what happiness and success really are, then this statement will, it can turn your life around from heading in the wrong direction, just mechanically pursuing success. Because if I get success, then I'll be happy. Now what about materialism? 
Is materialism really bad? What do you think? If I, if, if, if someone called you a materialist, would you take that as a compliment or an insult or you wouldn't care? How many would take it as an insult? Raise their hands. If someone said you're a materialist. Only one person raised it. How many would take it as a compliment? Raise your hand. Uh, how many wouldn't care? Raise your hand. <laughs> well, what does it mean to be a materialist? Have you thought about it? Most people today think that materialism isn't bad in of itself. A good measure of materialism in your life, that's nice. Huh? You also sort of feel like that? We shouldn't be anti-materialistic, often we think. And we should, some materialism is good, it's just we shouldn't get carried away, right? We shouldn't have too much materialism. That's the general conception. The general conception is that materialism is only bad when it replaces important things in life. It gets ahead of the important things in life, like having a meaningful job, a good marriage, nice kids, and good friends. If materialism surpasses those things, then it's bad. But otherwise, most people think a healthy amount of materialism in life is it's good. Often the argument is given to me uh, that, you know, Swami, this is not the spiritual age. This is the material age. <laughs> the ancient wisdom texts of India refer to the spiritual times. But these are material times. So it's different. <laughs> so many excuses I hear. We are in Australia now. It shouldn't matter what we eat because this is a meat-eating country, so when in Rome, do as the Romans do. <laughs> After all, it's, these are not spiritual times. Because we're living in material times, we should be material. So a good amount of materialism is nice. Now just think, based on what we discussed this morning, are you just matter? Are you just chemical hormones, the body, neurochemicals? Is that all you are? If you're just matter, if you're just chemicals, then doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter what you think. There's no difference between you and some chemicals that you wash down your kitchen sink. Right? No one laments when some chemicals are washed down the kitchen sink. Uh, but if someone pushes you or tries to push you down the drain of the kitchen sink, there'll be a great outcry. Well, you're just chemicals. What is the problem? So we saw this morning how so much of our Material life is driven by chemicals. But does that mean we are chemicals? What does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? Krishna is always pointing out to us the difference between matter and spirit. The difference between the body and the real self. The real self is spiritual. We should take that knowledge from Krishna. Krishna is the expert. Because Krishna is not limited. Krishna is the source of everything. Therefore, when Krishna says something, it has the most authoritative weight. So, when you think of the elements, the components that you like in your life, A meaningful job. How many of you feel that you have a meaningful job? Raise your hand. 
Only one person. A meaningful job. Yeah. Why is your job meaningful in of itself? Oh, I thought you said, do you like a meaningful job? No, no. How, Okay. <laughs> so no one feels they have a meaningful job, a job that gives their life meaning. That's a very honest of you all. In other words, jobs bring money, and with the money you hope to find meaning, right? <laughs> so when you're in between jobs and you're looking for work, how many of you, uh, you search the job Adverts, is this meaningful? How many, is this, is, this, is this job offer meaningful? Will it give my life meaning? No, you don't think like that. You think, will this job bring money? And with the money, I'll get meaning. <laughs> and then, you want a good marriage. Now what actually is a good marriage? You hope the marriage will bring you happiness, social respect, <laughs> security, stability. And then kids, you hope the kids will all be respectful and intelligent. If not respectful, at least intelligent. <laughs> and they're gonna grow up in Australia and not be Australian, right? <laughs> that's, that's the hope, right? <laughs> and you want friends. What are friends for? They approve of whatever you do. <laughs> they support you no matter what. And they know you're the greatest. That's why they're your friends, right? <laughs> so, are these the only elements or components we want for our life? And what about for our, for the children? What do you want to give to your children? Generally, people just say, I want my children to be happy. But if the parents don't know what happiness is, how do you expect the children to be happy? Think about it. If the parents have ignorance, they don't know the science of happiness, how are the children going to know how to be happy? It's a great tragedy. So in this way, the ignorance is passed down from generation to generation. But because society today mm, has no problem with ignorance, therefore everyone thinks it's fine. Oh, I don't know who, who I am. My children don't know who they are. But I want them to be happy. <laughs> I want them to be successful, even though they have no knowledge of the self. They don't know why they're here. They don't know what is matter, what is spirit. They don't understand the source of everything. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Those are not job requirements. <laughs> So in this way, the ignorance of the world gets deeper and deeper. Despite the vast stores of spiritual knowledge that India can offer. It is a great tragedy. Okay. Let's consider now happiness as most people think it is. They actually don't know what it is, but they just have a general idea. Uh, <clears throat> maybe before we go further, what's your definition of happiness? Do you have any takers? Anyone wants to comment? You're, yes, what's your definition of happiness? Thank you. Happiness is like a butterfly. When you, when you it's like a what? Butterfly. A butterfly. When you go after it, it will... It will run away and, and it will fly away. When you, when you stand still, it comes and sits on your shoulder. Oh. So you've been standing still? <laughs> huh? Trying to. Okay. Trying. That's an interesting observation. Of course, we must bear in mind Krishna's 
verdict in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, Nahi kaschit chanamapi jatu kishtakcha kalamakri. No one can stand still and do nothing, not even for a moment. <laughs> Everyone is forced to act, pushed by material nature. Anyone else? Thank you for that. Yes, what is happiness? I was gonna, given a numerical definition of happiness, a numerical definition. Go on. Which is desires achieved by, des divided by desires wanted. Oh, I see. Okay, and you've applied that statistical analysis to your life. <laughs> and every time it's a negative. <laughs> <laughs> and what is, so what does that teach you then? Huh? That it's always a negative. What does it teach you? It's always an illusion. So what are you going to do? Try harder. Huh? What are you going to, let him answer. You'll get your chance. I'm glad you're, you know, warming up now. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? That's not the correct definition, I presume. <laughs> it's all an illusion, you know, you can't have desires wanted, uh, divided by desires desired. Okay, so it's all an illusion, and you know that, right? So what are you going to do? That's why I'm here. Okay, <laughs> very good, very good. That's why I'm here also. <laughs> and I've been doing this for 40 years. <laughs> Anyone else, what is happiness? Yes, in the back. Um, anything that makes me feel good is happiness. Anything that makes you feel good. <laughs> Ooh, they love you here in Australia. <laughs> They'll definitely give you PR. <laughs> anything that makes you feel good. Anything. Right? Anything. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> now, are you a married man? Yeah. And you have children? No. <laughs> but you will probably in the future, right? Yeah. Okay. So what will you say when your children tell you that? Dad, we do whatever makes us feel good. <laughs> Uh, as for the right consciousness and not the wrong ones, not, the, not taking the wrong path. Now wait a minute, often the wrong path feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> you could come home from the office late and your wife asks you, where were you? And you can say, well, some of the secretaries and I, we had a little get together. <laughs> and your wife will say, why did you do that? It makes me feel good. <laughs> huh? And then when your children become teenagers, 13 or 14, they want to do so many things that you won't mention. And you say, well, why, why? This is not what your grandmother would approve of. And what will the children say? Dad, it makes us feel good. <laughs> What are you going to tell them? Huh? If the adults have no higher knowledge, how will the children have any higher knowledge? So you see, we're dealing with really deep and necessary issues now. And I really like that you apply your fine intelligence and integrity to these issues. They are vital importance. Anyone else? What is happiness? Happiness is contentment. Well, that's just changing words. Can, can you define contentment? Like whatever we do, if we are satisfied in whatever we are doing, that makes us feel better. Like if I am doing my job, if I am happy in doing my job, I will feel good. That the fact that comes out of, from, from the inside. And if I am at home, I have a body like a... If I'm saying Party. whatever, that's what I'm saying. Whatever we do, if I, if we are contented with whatever we are doing, that makes me feel happy. That's the same thing as what he said. If you feel good, then 
No, but not in the wrong path. Like in the <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Wait, what is this wrong path? This sounds old-fashioned. Where, who, who decides what is the wrong path? Whatever we do, we do have an inner self that tells us what we are doing. Where is that inner self? Where is it? Yeah. Inside your lungs, in your belly? Where is it? I don't know where it is. Huh? It's in the soul. The soul. Here? The soul? <laughs> Huh? <laughs> it can't be anywhere in the body. <laughs> in the heart? You've seen it with, you know, some scan? It can't be seen. How do you know then that, that, that such an entity exists? I don't know what is it, but something tells me if I'm doing something wrong. I Something tells you. Even if I'm doing something wrong and I like it, but there is something uh, that makes me believe that I am doing something wrong, that something is doing, going on wrong. Can you give us an example? As, uh, as an example, no, that will be personal with me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could slip that one behind you. Yeah? <laughs> Almost had him. <laughs> I know, you never do anything wrong, I believe it. But only there are lots of instances in which I do something, I know that I'm doing wrong, but, but I just have to do it, that's it. You just have to do it, why? <laughs> why? There must be some compulsion as according to the circumstances, so there must be some reason behind it that I have to do it. You have to do it. Yeah. You have to do wrong. It depends. It depends on the condition. I see. So your right path and wrong path all depends on circumstance. Not all. Not always. Many times. Lesser times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very, very interesting answers. Anyone else? What is happiness? Yes? Uh, trying to uh, make my parents happy. Trying to make your parents happy. Yeah. That's very noble. Mm. Now, do your parents know what is happiness? No, no I would like to guess my parents. So then how do, you, how do you know you're making them happy? Well, if I do something wrong, they'll basically slap me. If I... They slap you? Yeah. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I felt like when I was like young. Like, if I was like... Oh, you, you didn't, oh, if you grow up in Australia, it's illegal for parents to slap kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, if parents slap kids, the kid can call the police. <laughs> it's illegal. <laughs> okay, so he, he thinks that happiness is making his parents happy, but he knows his parents don't know what happiness is. So that's a difficult job, isn't it? Anyone else? What is happiness? It's a gap between two miseries. A gap between two miseries. You really accept that? Yeah, I do. And so what are you going to do with your life then? It's just material happiness. It's just like that. It's just temporary. Okay, all right. And so now what? I'll just try to learn spiritual happiness. How do oh. I speak with them? Okay, okay. I, I agree with that myself. <laughs> Anyone else? What is happiness? The ladies are not speaking this evening. They, yeah. A state of mind. A state of mind. So what does that mean? Just like you can change your mind? You can... Yeah, in case if I'm sad, if I play some good song, I can change my mind. If you hear some Bollywood song, then you feel better, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's all it takes, huh? Just the song. Something that makes you feel good. You know, we're back to that again. It's a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction. That's all, or part of it. 
Huh? Yes. It's all just a chemical reaction. No, no, that's not, not all just a chemical reaction. There's what? That's not all. Okay. Okay. Part of what people call happiness, yes, a major part is just brain chemicals. It's true. We heard this morning about how when people so-called fall in love, there's a brain chemical called dopamine that is just over flooding the brain. And it's more powerful than a drug and just as addictive. Anything else? Definition of happiness? I mean, everyone here wants to be happy, but it seems no one knows what it is. Okay, let's hear some of the attempts by so-called experts to label what is happiness, to, dis to define what is happiness. One says, uh, happiness is a combination of frequent positive emotions and a sense that your life is good. What do you think about that? A combination of frequent positive emotions. Is that what you all want? Frequent positive emotions? Sounds very... Insubstantial, doesn't it? You, can you imagine telling your children, my dear boy, my dear girl, I'd like that you have a combination of frequent positive emotions. <laughs> <laughs> That's all there is to life? That's why scientists are now thinking that if they just alter the chemical states in your brain, you'll be happy according to that definition. And that's why people take drugs. The drugs alter the chemicals in the brain and the people have drug happiness. So the scientists are thinking, since so much of what you call happiness is all due to chemicals in the brain, we just give you chemicals. And then everyone will be happy. They'll have a combination of frequent positive emotions. What about a sense that your life is good? I think that would be more important for you all. A sense that your life is good and that your family and relatives recognize your life is good. Yes. When you fly back to India, you know, to, to visit home, everyone pats you on the back. You're living the good life. You're a good man. You're established in Australia, bringing pride to the family. Your life is good. <laughs> what makes the good life? It's just some kind of social thing. Again, it's like marriages. If it's a very opulent marriage ceremony and relatives and friends have arrived from all over the world, then you feel, oh, this is good. Yeah? <laughs> but how deep does that go? When your friends and family respect you, you have a good job. Your life is good. Does it get any deeper than that? So think about it. One expert's definition of happiness. A combination of frequent positive emotions and a sense that your life is good. Here's what another one says. Happiness is the pursuit of engaging and meaningful activities. That means you're doing things that are so meaningful to you that you can lose yourself in those activities and you 
You don't even notice the passing of time. That's happiness. You don't notice the passing of time. You're so absorbed in what you're doing. Now, what, what could be like that? You had any experience where you did something, you got so absorbed in it, you didn't even know that time was passing? What is that? Tiredness. Huh? Tiredness. Tiredness? Sometimes it happens that I go to work in the morning and by the time uh, in a week, in a, it looks like uh, that it has been a minute and it's already 5.30 and I feel so tired. Because of working so hard. Uh, is that happiness? No, it's not happiness. <laughs> you just worked hard because you had to, right? Yeah. Well, this definition does not make any sense. But voluntarily absorbing yourself in something that's so absorbing, it engages you. Huh? Sports. Sports. Playing sports or watching sports? Both. Uh, watching a cricket match. Anything else? What about when ladies go shopping? Isn't it so absorbing? Time passes so quickly. <laughs> Doesn't look like this definition is very popular here. Pursuits of engaging meaningful activities that absorb you so much you lose track of time. What I think is the most popular definition of happiness is the sense your life is good and that others have that sense that your life is good. Social happiness, very important, right? Mm -hmm. You come to Australia, you cannot be known to have failed, right? What is the use in coming to Australia if you don't get the big job, the big house, that's pressure, actually. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure and it causes a lot of anxiety. And if you slip back, if you lose your job or something like that, oh, the anxiety is, what will others think? <laughs> so I think the social definition of happiness is Everyone seems to relate mostly to that. Okay, so. <clears throat> According to the mundane experts, your material sense of happiness, 50% comes from your genes, it's genetic. 40% is intentional, they claim that you, as a person, can shape your intent. It's up to you. And 10% is circumstances, which may be very difficult to change. So, according to them, because everything is material, they think, 50% genetic, you can't change. Some people, they claim, have a mental predisposition due to genetics towards being depressed or to being cheery. And then 10% circumstances, maybe your social circumstances, your economic circumstances, could be difficult to change. But the 40% they claim, that's up to you. You can change. They say 40% is up to the individual. But what Krishna points out in Bhagavad Gita is that even if you say 40% is up to the individual's intention, that individual is being shaped by powerful forces, which Krishna calls the gunas, the influences of material nature. Yes. 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 We will be discussing that. Yeah, yeah. Very good. You have read Bhagavad Gita. Probably, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard it from your grandmother. Uh, 
I've started reading it. Very good, very good, very good. Let's see what Krishna says about happiness. We'll hear it from the supreme expert. Sukam Tudanim Trividam Shrinume Bharatarshava Abhyasa Ramateyatva Dukantam Cha Nagatshati Krishna speaking to Arjuna. O oh, best of the Bharatas. Now please hear from me about the three kinds of happiness by which the conditioned soul enjoys and by which he sometimes comes to the end of all distress. Now please note that Krishna is not talking about spiritual happiness here. He's not talking about the three types of spiritual happiness. He's talking about material happiness. The kind of happiness that conditioned souls enjoy. That means... Conditioned souls mean those who are wrapped up in material nature, who identify with matter and the conditions of matter. What's the kind of happiness that they enjoy? These are the purports by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And this Bhagavad Gita is by far the number one Bhagavad Gita in the world. And it has inspired persons all over the world to follow Krishna's instructions. This version of Bhagavad Gita has indeed shown the world that Krishna is for everyone. Just like the sun may first rise in the east but the sun is for everyone. Of course, Krishna has nothing to do with this world, but in one sense you could say that Krishna is India's greatest export product. <laughs> it's taken over the world. <laughs> okay. We read Srila Prabhupada's purport. You see his picture right here on the Vyasa sun. A conditioned soul tries to enjoy material happiness again and again. Thus he chews the chewed. You know what that means? Chewing the chewed? Doctors tell you that if you're really going to be healthy, every mouthful of food you should chew 30 times. Does anyone here do that? Do you count? One, two, three. <laughs> They say if you really want to properly digest your food, you have to do that. Now just think, you, if you did chew 30 times, and then you gave what you chewed to someone else to chew. <laughs> and that person then gave it to, that person chewed 30 times and gave it to someone else. <laughs> so this, in a nutshell, is what is being referred to here. Thus he chews that which has already been chewed. Often parents do that with their children. My dear child, I have chewed material life thoroughly. Now I pass the, the great opportunity to you. Now you chew. <laughs> and then the children will get married and they'll have children and they'll pass They'll continue passing down what has already been chewed so thoroughly. There's no taste there. But social respectability, even though there's no taste. Others should see your life as good, even though you're not tasting anything. But sometimes, in the course of such enjoyment, he becomes relieved from material entanglement by association with a great soul. In other words, a conditioned soul is always engaged in some type of sense gratification. But when he understands by good association, that's what we're trying to have here, good association, that it is only a repetition of the same thing, and he is awakened to his real Krishna consciousness, he is sometimes relieved from such repetitive so-called happiness. <coughs> so Krishna is going to explain to you the three types of material happiness that a conditioned soul, a soul who's an illusion, who identifies with the body and mind and the material world as the self. The kind of happiness that a conditioned soul tries to taste. Next. Yatta agrevishamiva paniname mritopamam 
Tatsukam Satvikam Brotam Atma Bhuti Prasadajam. Now this is what we fear. We fear that bhakti, Krishna consciousness, following Krishna's instructions in the Gita is going to be like this. That which in the beginning may be just like poison, but at the end is just like nectar, and which awakens one to self-realization is said to be happiness in the mode of goodness. This is what everyone fears about spiritual life. They think, oh, it's... It's going to be so difficult in the beginning, restricting yourself, disciplining yourself, and in the far future, probably in the next life, you'll taste some happiness. I can't do that. I want to feel good now, right? I want my life to be successful now. I can't do all these spiritual practices based on a future hope for happiness, right? But you see... Krishna is not talking here in this verse about spiritual happiness. He's talking about material happiness. So the mode of goodness is happiness that makes a good jumping board to get the spiritual happiness. But spiritual happiness is always nectar. Not just at the end, but in the beginning too. The chanting of Hare Krishna the tasting of food offered to Krishna, knowledge of Krishna, serving Krishna, these things are nectarian. They are pleasurable from beginning to end. But if you don't know anything about bhakti, devotional service to Krishna, the science of bhakti yoga, uh, you'll have this fear that I'm going to have to do severe disciplines, controlling my senses, not doing this, not doing that, all for a future hope of happiness. That's too difficult in this day and age, right? As so many of you said, you want to feel good now. I will go to the next verse. Vishayendriya samyoga yatta agre mitopamam paniname vishamiva tatsukam rajasam shritam. Now, this is more familiar, yes? That happiness which is derived from the contact of the senses with their objects and which appears like nectar at first but poison at the end is said to be of the nature of passion. This is what everyone's into today. I'll let you read the purport. This is Bollywood, Hollywood, happiness. Happiness derived from a combination of the senses and the sense objects is always a cause of distress and should be avoided by all means. But in the beginning, material passion looks so attractive. There'll be peace, there'll be relief, there'll be absorption, there'll be engagement. But Krishna is letting you know that's just an appearance because mode of passion, happiness, always leads to distress. Arguments, fighting. Because you go deeper into the bodily conception of life. That means you become even more in illusion, thinking, I am this body, you are the body. And how can there be peace and contentment based on illusion? Next. Yada grey chanu bande cha suka mohana atmana nidralasya prabodhatam tatamasam udahirtam. And that happiness which is blind to self realization, which is delusion from beginning to end, 
and which arises from sleep, laziness, and illusion is said to be of the nature of ignorance. So that, I think this audience doesn't know so much about. This verse refers to the so-called happiness of intoxication, in which day after day you, be, you just drink alcohol, take drugs, and sleep all day. You don't even have any material goals, but to speak of spiritual goals. We can read the purport. So there's a difference between mode of passion happiness and mode of ignorance happiness. In the mode of passion, there is some kind of the word ephemeral. That means flickering or very temporary. There's a temporary appearance of happiness, like a shooting star in the sky. It's so quick. It goes away so quickly. But at least there's something there, like a mirage. But in the mode of ignorance, there's not even the illusion of happiness. It's just total distress from beginning to end. What's covering the world these days is a society based on happiness in passion and ignorance. The traditional culture of India was based on happiness in the mode of goodness, but that's breaking down, as you know. So that is Krishna giving his supreme expert analysis of the different types of material happiness. So again, remember, this fear of happiness in the mode of goodness, that it means following rules and regulations, restricting yourself, depriving yourself, controlling your mind and senses. Who can do that? And what is the reward? A future hope that you'll attain the supreme happiness. This is the fear that you have. But actually, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is giving you instructions. He's giving you the spiritual technology how to have happiness beyond the mode of goodness. The happiness of Krishna Bhakti, devotion to Krishna, is nothing material at all. And it is true happiness from beginning to end. the more you find out about the dynamic activities of devotion to Krishna, the more you'll know what is true happiness. Krishna, as a supreme expert in happiness, wants you to taste the supreme happiness. But what do we say? Oh no, we're too busy. Not now. We'll do it when we're old, right? First we must make money, buy a house, have a family, and then when we are in our 70s, then we'll listen to Krishna. <laughs> That's what we're thinking. But if Krishna is the supreme expert in happiness, and he wants us to taste the supreme happiness, why should we not take the offer? How can we be so foolish to reject this? So remember this classification and try to understand what type of happiness you're getting. Is it goodness, passion, ignorance? Or are you fortunate to be on the Krishna conscious platform beyond these three types of material happiness? <coughs> be open-minded, be objective, use your intelligence, analyze your life. Don't be afraid. Remember, we started off this morning by saying everyone should have an open mind and an open heart. Don't be stubborn, fanatical. You may start off as a fanatical materialist, but we hope that by the time the weekend's over, you'll open your mind. Don't be like one famous American comedian said. My mind's already made up. 
don't try to confuse me with the facts. <laughs> Please don't be like that. <laughs> All right. Would you recognize that there's a problem in sustaining good feelings? Has anyone ever noticed that that's a problem? Would anyone like to comment on that? It's, it's momentary. The, the so-called good feelings are momentary, yes? Momentary. You wonder what to do, huh? How to make those good feelings last? Anyone found a way? Or don't even worry about it. Just keep trying to make the money and have good social standing. What to do about sustaining good feelings? What about the, the one in the back, way in the back, who said that happiness means get, feel, get good feelings at the moment? How do you sustain those good feelings? By doing, continuously doing the good things. By continuously doing the thing that gives you good feelings, huh? Can you give me an example of continually doing something that gives you good feelings? Uh, like I like to watch and um, I like to watch cricket, so I continuously watch cricket. I Twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week, you watch cricket, huh? <laughs> That's just one of the things. You do that twenty-four hours a day. No. You know. Why not? Why can't you sustain it? kind of your self-image? No, that's what I meant. Why can't you sustain that good feeling that supposedly you get by watching a cricket match? Even if India loses, it's still a good feeling? <laughs> oh, they don't lose. <laughs> Not losing, huh? huh? How do you have a good feeling when your favorite team loses? Suppose India loses to Pakistan. <laughs> Is that a good feeling? How do you sustain the good feeling? You're going to watch cricket 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You couldn't do it. Even if there were matches round the clock, you couldn't do it. You'd have to do something else. Anyone else? Answer. Yes? Honest, good or bad, I don't know. I like that. Yes. <laughs> if you involve uh, Krishna in your emotions, everything will be good. But if you involve Krishna in your emotions, then you accept Krishna's judgment of what is good and bad. No, I'm not judging Krishna. No, but Krishna will judge you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you said, yes. you, you talked about Krishna. The Father, Krishna as the Supreme Father, knows what's best for the children. Just like when you have children, you hope to have children in the future, yes? So you expect that the, your son accepts that you know best, right? Mm -hmm. Right? The last thing you want is to have like a five-year-old boy tell you, Dad, I know what I'm doing, you don't know what you're doing. How would you feel? Uh, then it's my failure. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that he is the seed-giving father of all living entities. Sarvayonishakote, Sarvayonishimurta. So he said, don't you know, Arjuna, I am the seed-giving father of all creatures. So why don't we take, as children of Krishna, why don't we take his instructions? Uh, Bhagavad Gita means, says that we are doing everything in nature. And we are forced to do everything in nature. 
Yes, if you don't listen to Krishna, you're forced to do everything according to your, gen your genetic background, according to circumstances, and even your intention is all shaped by material nature. So if we involve Krishna in the Then you become free. Yeah, Otherwise you are shackled, imprisoned by your material past, your material makeup. Yeah. So what about sustaining good feelings? Who here is expert in sustaining good feelings? Everyone's a failure? Can't be done in the material happiness platform. Can't be done on the material happiness platform. So what are you going to do then? Looking for spiritual happiness platform. Yes, very good. Then you should listen to the supreme expert on happiness and apply his technology. Krishna's happiness never fails. That's why he's called achyuta, infallible. It means he never makes a mistake about happiness. <laughs> and what about us? We always make mistakes about happiness. We'll be talking more about that in the future. So sustaining good feelings, even if you want to call them good feelings. Actually, Krishna explains those so-called Good feelings to be rajaguna and tamaguna, motive, passion, motive, ignorance. But anyway, if you want to call those good feelings, there's a problem sustaining them. Even if you're in the mode of ignorance, tamaguna, you, you, the drug addict, the drunkard has to keep drinking, keep taking drugs to sustain that drugged and drunken feeling. If you want to escape the problems of life by sleeping all the time, you have to keep sleeping. <coughs> Difficulty su to sustain it. If you want the mode of passion, rajaguna happiness, you have to work so hard to try to keep getting more, more, more. <coughs> so there is a problem in sustaining even the imaginary good feelings. So you might want to make a major decision in life to have good feelings. I have a terrible marriage. I want a divorce. So you make the divorce and then you feel a feeling of relief. Now my options are open again. But how do you sustain that feeling of Relief. It doesn't last long. Especially if you divorce in Australia, you lose half of all your assets. <laughs> now in India as well. Now in India as well, also. So are they making in India now prenuptial agreements? Huh? You know what that is? Prenuptial agreements? that before the marriage, the legal marriage is done, uh, the man and woman sign a legal document that in case there's divorce, whatever assets we brought to the marriage go back to the individual. They sign a document. Are they doing that in India? You can do it in Australia. It's called prenuptial agreement. In the unlikely event of divorce, which is very likely. <laughs> I know the statistics in the USA of first marriages, 50% end in divorce. Second marriages, 65% end in divorce. Third marriages, 80% end in divorce. I was flying back from Delhi once to Sydney and Sitting next to me was a man, he was an American man, and it turned out he was the chief engineer of the Delhi subway construction. And so he was talking to me, and he was telling me about his life. He said, you know, I'm 45, and I recently divorced my wife of 15 years, 
And I married again very quickly. He said, but you know, it's just not working. We've been together for a year. I don't know. I said, what do you mean? You, you divorced one wife, now you quickly married another? What's the problem? Oh, it, the juice is not there. There's just no fire to it. I said, well, well. <laughs> what are you going to do? Just go from marriage to marriage, chasing this impossible dream? Oh, he said, oh, what can I do? The juice is not there. You know, you have to do what you have to do to feel good in the moment. And at the moment, this marriage is not tasting good. So, I don't know. I don't think it's going to last. I said, but you've only been with her for a year. But I can tell the fire is not there. <laughs> what do you think? Is that the kind of life you want? He's a very professional man. Chief engineer of the Delhi subway construction? Hmm. The good life, huh? <laughs> so again, the problem of sustaining good feelings. This is happiness in the mode of passion. It seems like, ah, oh, relief. Oh, this is nice. I divorced. I couldn't stand her. Oh, she was driving me crazy. And her mother was even worse. <laughs> now I'm free! <laughs> but that moment only lasts such a short time. You know, there have been studies, a very famous, there's one very, very famous study done of people who win the lottery millions of dollars and one year after they win the lottery their level of material happiness as measured by psychological tests is the same as everyone else two years ago there was a man in the USA in May he won the lottery for 50 million dollars Two months later, he won the lottery again for $25 million. What are the odds against that, the mathematical odds? And you look at his face, and he doesn't look any happier than anyone else. But even if he was happy, I won the lottery twice. Wow, amazing, twice in three months. But psychologists say a year from now, his level of happiness is going to be the same as any ordinary man. So, just see how tricky material nature is. How deep the illusion is. So please remember, there's a problem in sustaining so-called good feelings. If you can figure this out, you save yourself so much trouble. And Krishna wants that you understand this, because then, you can see through the whole mirage, the whole illusion. And that's the greatest gift you can pass down to your children. Knowledge of what is real, what is false. Knowledge of real happiness in connection to Krishna. Nityananda Priya, what time should we go to tonight? Um, 7.30. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? So let me bring up another point about happiness. Throughout the world, mundane experts have researched and discovered that when societies get to a level in which they meet the basic needs of everyone, politically, economically, socially, in terms of food, clothing, shelter, like that, um, voting, whatever that does, uh, when societies get to a minimum level that they offer that to everyone, more or less, then, no matter what people do in that society, 
there's no increase in their level of happiness as measured by psychological tests. In other words, beyond a basic middle class standard of living, any increase, any further increase in wealth or luxury does not lead to an increase in happiness. What do you think about that? Beyond a basic, very basic middle class standard. So I ask you, how many of you are just going to be satisfied with a very basic middle class standard of living? Raise your hands. No, everyone wants the big time, right? <laughs> you came to Australia to make it big. But, be scientific. We have so many engineers here. You're all very thoughtful persons. Beyond meeting the basic needs in a middle class, a basic middle class family, not high middle class, but basic middle class family, any further increase in income or luxury does not lead to any more material happiness. What do you think? Yes? Not about happiness, it's about sorrow. So, what do you mean by that? We, we, we could be content with what we are earning and what basic, basic wealth we have, but when we see other people having more than us, then we get. Yes, that's a very, we'll be talking about that. It's called social comparison. Yes. Good we point. Go, we'll be getting to that. Yeah. Then we go to mode of passion. Yes. You're already in the mode of passion, but you go with more passion, right? <laughs> and then when you get frustrated, what is the alternative? Huh? <laughs> That's the fortunate person, huh? Some people do, but others go the other way. What's the other way? Which is so popular. Intoxication. Yes, you know, amongst the Indian community in Australia, drinking is becoming a problem, right? The unstated reality, alcoholism. So let us think. We are chasing after something that we don't know what it is. We're pursuing happiness, but we don't know what happiness is. Maybe our life is just being wasted. Did you ever think like that? Your life could be a waste? Tomorrow morning we're, look, we're going to look at something very dramatic to help you to see that our human life is so precious, it can end at any moment. We shouldn't waste it. And tomorrow morning, we're going to discuss how our concepts of what we should do with our life are so much influenced by society. And we're not thinking for, our th we're not thinking for ourselves. But then you'll tell me, what is the social reward for thinking for yourself? No one cares, eh? But you just do what everyone else does? You get respect, right? But how much does that respect mean to you? If you walk amongst a bunch of kangaroos or other animals, and they all bow down, does that mean something to you? <laughs> you walk around here and some rabbits come and touch your feet. <laughs> does that really mean something to you? But the average human being has no more knowledge than a kangaroo or a rabbit. And we're basing our whole life on that. And then you'll have children and pass down the same standards to your children. Always act in a way that you are respected. Do good. Be known as good. 
feel that your life is good. There's no death to that. And the children won't accept it. What will your own children tell you? Oh, that's the old country stuff. We are in Australia. Do what makes you happy. Huh? Do what makes you happy. That's what my parents told me. Of course. But you see, that's, uh, how do you say, more direct Australian uh, dharma. <laughs> so called dharma. But you have to understand that in India it's more roundabout. You're just going directly to touch your nose. We have to learn how to do like this. <laughs> it's not do what makes you feel good, it's do what makes others think good of you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> it's indirect hedonism. The Aussie way is just direct hedonism. Right? Who cares what others think? If it feels good to you, just do it. But the Indian way is, if the others feel that it's good, and your life is good, then you are success. <laughs> of course, what Krishna presents as good has nothing to do with either conception. Krishna is the supreme good. If you take your knowledge of what is good from Krishna, then you are a success. Let me ask you another question. Economists used to have the idea that if people would make a lot of money, then they would get to a point where they didn't want any more money and they would devote their time to philanthropic activities or spiritual pursuits. In other words, money, more money would have lost its utility. That's an economic term it would have no value to people anymore because they had so much money already. And that way they would just stop working so hard and use their free time for charity or for spiritual pursuits. What do you think? They thought that, but it never happened. There is no definition of enough money. Right. The because it's Rajaguna, mode of passion. More, 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 more. No one stopped. So that theory, that economic theory is now forgotten. <laughs> and there are two reasons why you can't stop, even if you wanted to. Because I know some of you are thinking, oh, this is too much, this pressure, this rat race, oh, every day, oh, oh I can't do this. So much pressure from family, from relatives, oh. <laughs> and then I'll have children, and I have to push the children the same way, oh, I can't do this. You might think to stop, but there are two things that are preventing you from stopping. Number one is a term called habitual patterns of consumption. You have a habit of just buying and consuming at a certain level. And it's so difficult to stop. Habit energy is very powerful. So over the years you build up these habit patterns of consumption. And it's very difficult to go against those habits. You're used to living in a certain size house, you used to having a certain number of cars, you used to having a certain amount of money in the bank, and you can't live otherwise. You know, if you marry a girl who's accustomed to a certain standard of opulence, that's what's going to have to be, right? <laughs> she can't accept anything else because that's the way her parents raised her. She has habitual patterns of consumption. So that is half the reason why people cannot 
stop making money if they have the chance. If they're forced to, they'll stop, but otherwise they won't stop. Number one is habitual patterns of consumption, and number two is social comparison. You may want to stop, but you look around and what do you see? Ooh, they've got more money. How can I have less? <laughs> Very powerful, isn't it? Especially among families. I know my family. I will admit, they try to pressure me in that way sometimes. Well, in the past, they've given up now, but in the past. I say, look at your youngest brother, especially when you bring up the success of the youngest brother to the oldest, I'm the oldest brother. Oh, it doesn't bother me, but they think it's a major point. Look at what your youngest brother is doing. Your youngest brother, he's making seven figures a year. He's on the board of Toyota. He's the general counsel for Toyota. Look at your middle brother. He's a doctor, CEO, who's managing a medical charity funded $200 million a year. They're all up there. What about you? You could have been up there, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they try to make you feel bad. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> it's pressure, isn't it? Can you imagine that pressure? You could have been up there, too. You were the oldest. You were the most successful until at the age of 22, you met that Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. <laughs> you met Krishna. <laughs> you could have been up there. <laughs> what do you think? You are interested in getting to the spiritual life? Yeah, but is it that we, we can't get into without it? You have to start somewhere. Krishna is very practical. Is you can't right? expect a child, a newborn child, to start walking. It's a gradual development, don't worry. And Krishna is the most kind father. Because that's what we read in Bhagavad Gita all the time. But, but that, that is the completely healthy standard, but you have to take steps to get to your original healthy condition, okay? Because what we read it otherwise, it was the oh, side said that uh, Krishna always supported to work and not, not to get into himself, like get into the spiritual life fully, like he was always saying to Arjuna that you have to do your uh, work, you have, because you are Kshatriya, so you have to, you have to fight. Oh, this is only half the, this is only half. One side of the coin. You've got to give both sides of the coin. Krishna says, you have a right to do your duty, but you're not entitled to the results. Yes. And the whole point of Bhagavad Gita is that Krishna is saying, work for me. Not just work. <laughs> okay? Let's see the whole picture. <laughs> It's a common misunderstanding. Wherever I go in India, that question will always come up. Swamiji, doesn't Krishna say you must work? You must do your duty. Finish. Bah. <laughs> no, Krishna says work for him. Do your duty for him. So again, if somebody, I'm not including myself into that, if somebody is like... But include yourself. You speak for you. Uh, no, if somebody, You're among friends. Uh, if, if, if you're talking if the results are offered to Krishna, then it is spiritual. Yeah, of course, if they say that, like if what, whatever they are earning, and uh, they are maybe not, of course, not all, but yes, yeah, they are spending and they are saying that we are keeping Krishna in the center, and they really do it. Yes. Then they are doing the spiritual thing. Yes. Uh, then why can't they make more money than why we are saying that making more money is a problem? No, no, making more money is not the problem if you give it to Krishna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by giving it to Krishna? Just 
You find where Krishna is being genuinely served and you give your money there. That takes some discrimination, some intelligence. But we are educating so that everyone has that intelligence. We have many persons who are following Krishna's instructions who are big CEOs, big executives. But they have a Krishna-centered life. But I, in my case, I was talking about you know my brothers and you know my family. They're you know <laughs> they're not thinking about a Krishna-centered life. They're simply thinking your brothers are a material success. You could have been that. You could have been up there too. But <laughs> you understand. <laughs> so we are not against anyone being a CEO. We're not against Arjuna for being a chaptria, for being a warrior. Krishna gave him the instruction, Mama Nusma Yudjam Cha, fight and think of me. <laughs> so it's all how your occupation is used. So I was just giving that example about my brothers to show you the pressure that family can put on you. <laughs> Of course, I also know that in private sometimes, my brothers come to me with tears in their eyes. Oh, the routine is too much. How did you avoid it? We can't take it anymore. The daily grind, the daily routine. <laughs> I remember when my brother was in, my middle brother was in med school. He was, he was married. And I would sometimes visit I was out of the USA, I would visit the USA, and I remember his wife was crying, oh, I can't take this, I never see him, he's in med school, just study, study, now he's an intern, I never see him, oh. <laughs> I would try to console him, he'll be all right, he'll be all right. Now, 30 years later, when I bring that up, I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. We forget so easily <laughs> all those struggles. So my point is that we're talking about social comparison. How it's very difficult to get out of passion and passionate drive because everyone around us is pushing us. Look at your brothers. Look at your cousins. We sent you to Australia not to vacation. We sent you to go to the top of the corporation. Pressure, right? Hmm? Yes. Just, a, just a quick question. Uh, it's, I've heard of, of uh, this Karmanya Vadika Rasti Mahapali Shukri. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're knowing Bhagavad Gita. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. But uh, whatever I've heard. Uh, so that fella, is it the, the, the materialistic uh, part of it? Of part of the world that you're talking about. What, what is that? When Krishna says, Bala, fruit, he means what you earn from your activities, what you get. That belongs to Krishna. You can't have that. And is that material? Mm -hmm. is that material? But everything is owned by Krishna. Material and spiritual. Krishna is the supreme proprietor. So what are you going to tell Krishna? I can't give this to you. It's material. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> that doesn't work. Because material energy belongs to Krishna. And the spiritual energy belongs to Krishna. Then how do you survive? You take what you need to live a simple Krishna conscious life. Say it again. Like, donating all your money in the temple except what you need for your basic needs. Do that mean giving it to Krishna? That's a good start. But you have to, with knowledge, see how that is appropriate. You see, bhakti, Krishna consciousness, is based on knowledge, not blind following and fanaticism. That's what you all are afraid of. Blind following of tradition, right? 
Like someone comes up to you in India and says, I am a Brahmana, please, 5,000 rupees. <laughs> I tell the story once I was riding, what do you call those things in Delhi, trikes? Auto rickshaw. Auto rickshaw, yes. And, and we agreed on the price to go to Kanat Circle. And then when we got there, uh, the man, of course, he tried to jack up the price. So I told him, sorry, sorry. Uh, we agreed on the price, you know, 10 rupees. That's what you get. This is many years ago, 1978. So he became angry. Do you understand who I am? And he reached under his dirty shirt and he pulled up a Brahmin string. <laughs> Gee, do you understand who I am? I said, yes, I understand who you are. And um, you're just getting 10 rupees. <laughs> so you are afraid of that. It's like I've heard so many cases. You want to get married, you get the astrology done, the, the horoscope done. You go to one Brahmana, oh, ain't not compatible, bad couple. 4,000 rupees. <laughs> oh, what to do? We want to marry. I, I like this girl. I, I like this man. Oh, find another Brahmana. And you go to another Brahmana. We went to the first Brahmana. We paid him 4,000 rupees. Uh, he said it's not a good marriage. What do you think? Oh, very good marriage. Very good. <laughs> 5,000 rupees. <laughs> I heard it happens. <laughs> So you are afraid of that. Blind, fanatical following of tradition, which leads to so much cheating. Therefore, we should know what Krishna says, and then we can distinguish what is real, who is for real. Learn the spiritual technology. Just like if you know IT, you can distinguish between who is a cheater and who has IT knowledge. Similarly, you should learn the science of Krishna. And then you won't have this fear of being cheated by hypocrites, pretenders. As Srila Prabhupada explained often, what ruined India's contribution to the whole world is this Brahmana by birth concoction, this false idea that someone becomes a Brahmana by birth. He said that has ruined India's contribution that it, it could make to the whole world and rescue the whole world. Because now no one takes, very few take uh, Vedic knowledge seriously because they look at the so-called Brahmanas and say, this is the result of studying the Vedas? <laughs> so we need to change that. And this ISKCON society is doing that. It's working hard to present real Brahmanas and show people that the knowledge of Krishna is the most powerful wealth in the world. Anything else? Let's see if someone else has something to say. Thank you. So we are at a critical point now. We're starting to understand that we don't know what is real happiness. We're chasing an illusion, a dream, that's often a nightmare, and we have to work so hard and struggle so hard under so much pressure. What will others think? Social comparison. What about my habitual patterns of consumption. I can't stop. So much pressure, so much anxiety, and then you're going to have children and raise the children in the same way. Is that what you want? To pass down this kind of life to your children in which they don't know who they are, but they just do things to, so that they're known as good persons amongst the relatives and family. It's so shallow, so hollow. This is not what Krishna is talking about in Bhagavad Gita. 
This is not the kind of life that Krishna recommends. So, there's nothing wrong with tradition, but when the knowledge that supports the tradition is gone, then the tradition, the tradition is so hollow and empty, and therefore you don't want it anymore, because you don't know what is the knowledge behind it. Why shouldn't we just do what makes us feel good at the moment? There's no knowledge anymore. So Hollywood and Bollywood come along and say, just do it. Wow, that sounds great. Especially, you're here in Australia, the families back in India, they can't see what you're doing. Right? They can't see what you're eating or drinking or all those things. You can experiment and no one will ever know. And what do you tell yourself? Well, I'll try a few things. I won't get as far out there as the Aussies, but I'll try a few things, right? <laughs> because there's no knowledge. And then, when it's time to marry, suddenly the boy and girl are both goody-goodies, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know what's going on. <laughs> Do you know how to cook? Yes. <laughs> Will you want to live in Australia? Yeah. <laughs> Do you like my mother? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so what we are stressing this weekend is let us find out the spiritual technology the greatest wealth that Krishna gives and then we have the greatest gift to pass down to our children see what adventures we'll explore tomorrow in our last two sessions. So I thank you for your kind attention. Hare Krishna.